My name's Chris Payne, and this is my Broken Not Dead story. I ended up when I was 11 years old, I remember my brother uh, had came around and it was me and my friend and my brother and his friend. And uh, I remember him taking us uh, to the woods out back behind the house. And, uh, and when I was 11 years old, for the first time ever, I smoked weed for the first time. And uh, you know, and it was at that time that, you know, I felt like I found something. And so I'd, uh, I started a journey of drugs and alcohol at the age of 11. Uh, graduated high school, 2004, ended up getting my own place with me and some friends, and then um, got out on my own and just party all the time. I ended up getting in some trouble, uh, got a DUI, ended up going to jail, and I remember I couldn't pay my bills anymore, so I ended up having to move back in with my mom. Uh, my mom, when I moved back in with her, she told me, she said, Chris, you're gonna have to go to rehab. You, you can't keep doing this. And she thought that that was gonna be the answer to everything. And so I went to my first rehab, and uh, I think it may have been, like I said, 2005 or 2006. I went to Oxford, Mississippi called the Haven House. And I went there, and it was, uh, um, I went to rehab, y'all, because I had back problems. What do I mean? I mean, I had my family in the law on my back. I went because I had them on my back, and I was just trying to get them off. Um, I went to, ended up going to seven different rehabs in and out of jail. And that was my life from 2005 until 2013, was rehabs and jails. My mom had done given up on me. She said, Chris, you can't live here anymore. My, bro my, uh, my grandmother, I'm sorry, Chris, you can't live here anymore. And so I was out there on my own, not having anywhere to turn to. And then I went to uh, my brother. My brother said, okay, Chris, you can live here if you want to. But one thing, I know what you do, and you're not fixing to bring that stuff in my house. And y'all, at this point in time, I was serious. I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to. I wanna do right. And see, mind you, this is the same brother that originally had, you know, got me smoking weed from the very get-go. Well, see, he has done changed his life by now, and so he knew, and he said, Chris, it's not happening in my house. And I remember, it was two days after Christmas, December 27th, it was on a Friday. I remember leaving my brother's apartment, going to work, and he told me, he said, Chris, he said, when you get off work, he knew I was getting paid, he said, when you get off work, I need you to come straight here and bring me money, bring me the rent, rent money. I said, okay, all right, I will, I will. He said, now make sure you do. I said, okay. So I left there wanting to do that, you know, had the best intentions. This is what I'm gonna do, get to work, you know, work throughout the day, I get paid, and I'm leaving. And out of nowhere, when I'm leaving, I'm heading out to the parking lot, here comes somebody pulling into the parking lot. And of course, they knew I got paid. And so they pull up, hey, Chris, Chris, hey, 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 what's going on? And next thing I know, I get in the car with them. And so this is probably maybe like five o'clock on Friday. I get paid maybe $500. And so, so I get in the car with them. And next thing I know, $500? that I got paid with, remind me, or remind you, I have to pay my brother rent money. Well, the $500 I had and got paid by 11 o'clock that night, it got down to $0. I had spent all my money on drugs once again. And I'm at this place just beating myself up. Man, I can't believe I did it again. Man, I can't believe, here I am. I'm no good, why do I even? And so I told the people I, I was with, I said, hey, I said, is there any way I can stay with y'all tonight? I really don't want to go back to see my brother. I, I, I just can't, I can't uh, face him right now. And of course, while I have money, yeah, they're there. But as soon as the money goes, guess what else goes? They do. And they say, no, Chris, I mean, we, no, you can't tonight, sorry. We'll take you wherever you want to go, but, but you can't stay with us. And I said, okay, all right. Then just take me back to my brother's house. I'm standing on the outside of my brother's apartment and I'm looking on the inside and I watch the, um, the lights on the inside in the living room and I wait until the lights turn off. Finally, about midnight, he goes to bed and I finally sneak inside so I don't have to face him. And so here I am on midnight sitting 
on my brother's couch where I was living at the time, filled with guilt. And so my only way out I seen at that time was just to take my own life. And so I remember like it was yesterday. I went to the medicine cabinet and I grabbed a bottle of extra strength Tylenol. And I grabbed that bottle and I go back and I'm sitting on the couch just like I am right here. And I grab the bottle and I pour them out. And as I pour them out, I'm counting each one of them. And I count out 70 extra strength Tylenol. And I grab them. And I just chew them up. Just swallow them. Just swallow them. And see, I didn't grow up in church, didn't grow up with God or anything like that. And so, you know, when we get in that place, you know, it's, it's funny how we can cry out to God. You know, so here I am, I've just taken 70 extra strength Tylenol and I say, God, if you're there, please don't let me wake up. I can't do this anymore. I don't want to. What's the point? And so there I am and I finally pass out. And about a day, about, you know, the next afternoon, I finally come to and my brother, he comes in there. The one day he decided to have a headache, he decides to go look for some Tylenol. It's not in there. He sees the bottle and the um, in the trash can, sees me laying on the couch. He puts two and two together. He realizes I took the whole bottle of extra strength Tylenol. And so he calls my mom. And when he calls my mom, he tells her what happened. And so I wake up, man. My stomach is just aching. My stomach is just hurting. So I run to the trash can to try to throw up. And as I'm trying to throw up, nothing's coming up, you know? I mean, I haven't eaten anything. There, I was, you know, doing what I do. So I hadn't eaten anything, and so nothing was coming up. And I remember my mom came and got me, and she took me back to her house, and she called the poison control company, and they told her, a set of menaphine poisoning, that's the worst type of poison. You need to get him to the hospital ASAP. And so here I am about 11, 11 or 12 on Friday night is when I'm taking it. Finally, they put me into the hospital and I see you on Sunday around 11 or 12, almost exactly two days later. Well, they finally put me in the ICU and they, they tell me, you know, as, as calmly as they could, they said, Chris, uh, the pills have already dissolved and headed to your liver. Normally we would pump out your stomach, but there's nothing we can do now. We're basically going to keep you in ICU and keep you as comfortable as possible until your liver shuts down and you die. Uh, uh, they told me your enzymes in your liver are supposed to be, I think, maybe around 100. They told me mine were at 9,000. And so they basically kept me there until I was ready to die. You know, long story short in that, two weeks into it, and I pull out of it. I pull out of it, man. And so this point in my life, you know, you would think, okay, Chris, you just tried to kill yourself. God pulled you out of that. And here you are, your life has got to change now. No, when I got out of that hospital, I was filled with even more guilt, even more shame, even more just burden, unworthiness. I just tried to kill myself, couldn't even do that. Now the one thing I was trying to hide, the brokenness that I was trying to hide from everybody, now everybody knows about it. And so I, know, I didn't ever know how to deal with that brokenness I had on the inside of me. So what I do? I ran back to the drugs, to the alcohol, cycle again. I end up back in rehab. Me and the guy that was in there, he was in the program as well. And he said, Chris, I want to talk to you. We started talking about prayer. And, and I said, okay, let's talk. You know, he said, man, man, pr there is power in prayer. I was like, okay, what do you mean? He says, my wife works at the hospital. And, uh, and there was a young man that came in there. I said, okay, I'm listening. There was a young man that came in there and he took a whole bunch of pills, Chris. And, and the doctor said that he was gonna die, that he wasn't gonna make it. But my wife, she was the nurse that was to take that young man some fluids. But you know what my wife did? I said, what was it? He, my wife gathered that bag of fluids. She told, okay, all the doctors, hey, let's pray over this bag of fluids before we take it in here to this young man. And then they, she, he said that they all prayed over that bag of fluids. They took it in there to that young man and he looked me in the eyes. He said, Chris, and you know what? I said, what is it? He said, that guy made it. And I looked back at him and I told him, I said, you know what? I said, you know who that guy is? I said, that's me. That was me. And man, that right there was a, was a marker in my life. Man, when I didn't believe in myself, somebody else believed in me. When I couldn't even pray for myself or even have the unction to want to pick myself up, somebody else believed for me. 
And I believe it was the prayers of others and, the, and other people believing in me is what, what got me up. And so I got out of there, you know, ended up falling back into it again. Back here. Now I'm at 2013 and, and uh, I'm back in my addiction again. It was right before my last rehab. I was staying with my mom again, and I got two phone calls this day. I remember one phone call was my boss man I was working with. He called me, he said, Chris, I know you stole my pills. I know you stole my uh, the stuff that was in my truck. Come turn yourself in, or I'm calling the law. And of course, I'm saying, no, 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 I didn't do it. I didn't do it, I don't know what you're talking about. And then I got another phone call and it was my mom, and my mom said, Chris, I'm done. I'm done again. This is it. When I get off of work, I need you out of my house. I cannot do this anymore. So I was faced with all this again. The, the weight of the guilt and the shame just falling back on my shoulder. The only way out I thought I seen once again was suicide. I grabbed an extension cord looking for a place to try to hang myself, and I got another phone call. It was my buddy. He talked me out of it. And they had connected me with a place in Russellville, Alabama called the Russellville Dream Center. It was a faith-based program. They said, Chris, you've done everything else. You need to try to go to this place. And, and, and I went on March 4th, 2013, I went to the Russellville Dream Center. I'll tell you this though, I went because I was running. I was running from all this that I'd wreaked, all this havoc I'd wreaked, and I was running from it to a place Little did I know, as I was running from my problems, I was running to my God. I was running to the solution and didn't even know it. And so here it is on March 4th, 2013. My mom takes me to the Russellville Dream Center. She drops me off. She tells the people at the front desk, if he leaves, don't call me, I'm done with him. And so here I am, ready to change. And what it was is when I went into that program, I seen it in somebody else. I, I seen the hope and the love and the joy of Jesus in somebody else. I seen somebody else see something good in me. And when they seen something good in me, it then made me think, okay, maybe there is something more to this life. And then it was on March 10th, 2013, on the top bunk of room six, that I surrendered and gave my life to Christ. And see, and it was at that point in time, it's like the, that weight that had been on me for, for my whole life uh, of the guilt and the shame, the, the, uh, the failures and everything else was lifted off. That, that void, that emptiness on the inside of me had been filled. I found identity. I found acceptance. I found a love that I had been chasing all my life, trying to feel something on the inside of me. And finally, there with arms wide open, my father was waiting on me. Brokenness and all. He said, come to me. And it was at that time that I surrendered. And, uh, in a couple of weeks, March 4th, it's gonna be uh, eight years that I've been clean and sober. It was a six month program at the Russellville Dream Center that I was there. I ended up staying there for five plus years. And man, God had done such a mighty work there that Man, my kids was taken from me through that process. I now have full custody of my son, praise God, you know? And, and, and through that, I, I, was, I was ordained to become a, a pastor, a preacher. And at the beginning of 2018, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Chris, I want you back in Tupelo. I got people in Tupelo I want you to reach. And so it was at that time, I took a step of faith to, to go back out to Tupelo. And there I, I had a, a ministry just birthed on the inside. That's where this comes from. A way out ministry. He said, Chris, I want you to tell them that there's a way out. 